a lot of what is coming out uh, over the course of the day is somewhat disjoint pieces of the bigger picture. Uh, and I'd like to find a way to tie this all together for everybody so that you can understand what the overall objective is. The big question I think that everybody has, and somebody uh, brought this up earlier, um, it, to paraphrase, is uh, it all revolves around uh, how to get better heights in an area where it's always moving. What are we, what are we really, really doing to address that problem? Uh, the old uh, basic facts, subsidence happens. There's nothing that we can do, really. I mean, we can stop groundwater extraction, but subsidence is going to happen. The old way of getting those heights was leveling. And the only way to really address that issue in an area like this is to just keep leveling and to level far distances to get to solid ground. And that's expensive and you can't go back and redo it. Because if you do it, it's going to keep subsiding and you got to do it again and it subsides and you got to do it again. So that's not really a practical solution for this. Um, GPS is the thing that, that everybody's turning to to try and figure out how to do this. GPS has its inherent limitations, but we have gotten it down to the point where we can get two centimeter on the right heights out of GPS with the right procedures. Uh, as Daisy said earlier, it's uh, probably, we could probably even do it better than what we've specified in NGS 5859. The technology is getting better. Than Constellations, there's satellites up there, there's a lot of things, there's more, uh, uh, the spacing of the cores is better. There's a lot of things that have improved since 58 and 59 came out that probably enable us to do even better with easier procedures than what's outlined there in many parts of the country, maybe not here, but in many parts of the country. So we've got this GPS, and this might be the answer to how we solve this problem. The missing piece of that is the GUI model, and not just the gravitational GUI model, but that hybrid that we're trying to get. Now, this is a circular uh, process. <coughs> to get the hybrid model, you need the GPS on benchmarks, and to get GPS on benchmarks, you could, you have to have good bending heights. So now we're back to level. So this is not a long-term solution that really makes sense to a lot of people. In addition to all this, what you really want is real time. That's what people want. They want to go out there and get this in real time. So how do we figure out how to use the GPS, how to get a really good GUI model, and then how to have that all be so good that you can do it in real time and get the text that you want? Well, part of it for now is finding better ways to update this hybrid model. And that's what we're doing with the technical report 50, with these repeat surveys, trying to get additional information in there, using Opus DB perhaps to get us uh, repeat measurements at particular benchmarks so we can monitor what's going on. So that's the short term. The long term is looking at this, this gravitational geoid model and just finding a better way to, to redefine the vertical datum overall. That gravitational geoid model will be a little bit easier for us to maintain than constantly going back and trying to recreate a hybrid <coughs> because the gravity is not changing as quickly as the surface is changing because we've got cores to look at how ellipsoid heights are changing and so we can use that to see what's going on with the surface. Uh, we observe cores and GPS a lot easier than we can go out and level. So we've got that way to monitor. And we've got a program in place, a plan for monitoring the gravity field and modifying, updating that to model when we need to. So this is the long-term solution to this. So I don't know if that helps tie things together a little bit for everybody as far as the direction that we're trying to go in. But this is how you know, the leveling, the subsidence, the GPS, the GUI model all works together. Question? Yeah, the question about the hybrid GUI. Mm -hmm. um, one of the speakers earlier alluded to mid 90s, maybe the last time that a VDA published data came out. I'm assuming that it's a iPod VDA being used in a hybrid, not the We've actually, now suppress all we actually have come back and done some re leveling, but okay. we don't have. 
like a really good long level line. Okay. Um, so a lot of what we're looking at are, are as much height differences. The other part of what we're doing is we're looking at, <coughs> since you're looking at how, um, what the impact is of subsidence on, on the reference frame, on the network, on, on what's going on down here, you're looking at changes in elevation, changes in any median gain <coughs> from five years ago to now are going to be the same more or less as changes in the ellipsoid height five years ago and to now. So you can look at the height change over time using cores and going out and doing repeat GPS surveys, which will allow you to see in the lower level. So there's, I don't know if that answers your question. The height based on the water the ellipsoid change and data level. The height mod is the ultimate, the, the way height mod works best is in an area that is stable where you've got a good handle on the jewelry model. Where you don't have a good handle on the jewelry model, you have to iterate to it. You have to work your way there. So we have tried to make a better jewelry model here in Southern Louisiana with all the historic data leveling and GPS that we've got. Is it is it as good as it is in Kansas? No. Um, we, we're getting there, but each time we come through and try and get more data or you know, find some more information to improve that jury model, hopefully we're, we're getting to where we have more accurate um, control for you, for you all to use. At the very least, hopefully we have consistency between the marks that we're publishing, so that you have, us, have that to go with. Other questions? Now what Mark Schoenberg is going to talk about is some of the tools that we're hoping um, will both help you guys but also will help us in the long run get some of this important survey data so that in the near term we can improve those three models in the long term we get down to the new data. I am Mark Schenowork, and my first question to you is, can you hear me? I see nods all across the room, so I'll take that as a yes. I get the pleasure of talking about Opus. That's what I primarily work on now, or primarily what my boss lets me work on. And I'm going to divide my talk into two parts. The first part is essentially going to talk about Opus as it is now. So for those few brave souls who said they've never used Opus, by the time I get done, you will consider yourselves Opus masters. Uh, the second half of my talk, believe it or not, I'll talk about the things that are coming in Opus that makes it even better than it is right now. So Opus is the online user positioning service. It's a growing set of web-based tools that give you access to the to the information and products and software that we make available through NGS. It's primarily now consists of two, two things. It consists of a pair of processing applications and then it consists of an option to publish. If you haven't already been there, please go there. It's where all the cool kids hang out. Uh, I've given the email address, uh, the uh, URL addresses for the NGS webpage. There's a link to Opus there and then a direct link to the Opus website. I like to say that Opus is beautiful in its simplicity. You go to the web page and what do you see? We ask you four questions. We need to know your email address so we can send the answers back to you. We'd like to have your data because we can't do much without it. We need to know what kind of antenna you have and how far above the market is. Four questions. You do that, you click a button, and in a few minutes you get coordinates back that we claim are probably going to be good to a couple centimeters. What could be better than that? Perfect. Again, if you haven't seen it before, this is what the new Opus web page looks like. Some of you may not have been there for a while. We've got a new look and feel. Hopefully this makes it better. But you can see the four questions, your email address, your data set, your antenna type, and your height above the mark. And then you click one of these two upload buttons, and lo and behold, away you go, and you're happy with an answer soon coming. But those of you who are still awake will have noticed I said there are two upload buttons. Why are there two upload buttons? Well, it turns out that you need a different strategy to process data sets that are relatively short and data sets that are relatively long. So we still, uh, for, the, 
for the uh, mindset of the user, we give two buttons to do that. Now, having said that there are two processing strategies, and I'll talk about those in the next slide or two, having said that, everything that goes through into actually processing your data is otherwise essentially the same. We use the state-of-the-art models. We use the best available data from cores. We use the state of the, uh, the best available uh, precise ephemerides that are available. And we, both of them eventually come to the point where they use ionosphere-free integer fixed phase to do the processing. I'm going to take a moment here just to say, because I, I give presentations like this to other groups, this is a question that exists in people's minds. Uh, the, and I'll come back and touch upon this later again, try to drive it home to you. But there are actually, the precise ephemerides come from the International GNSS Service. They produce three products, a precise ephemeris, which is the best you can possibly do, a rapid ephemeris, which is available within 24 hours, and an ultra rapid, which is available every six hours and is predicted into the future. A few years ago, there were significant differences between those three products. Now, essentially, they're identical. It's, it, would be it, it would be extremely difficult for you to tell them apart, and even though I work in this field, it's difficult for me to tell them apart. So the idea of using rapid or ultra rapid products don't worry about it. It's, it. They're all as good as they can get. All right, coming back to the, to the integer fixing strategies. You have a satellite orbiting the Earth. You're sitting on the ground. Uh, unfortunately, there's lots of nasty things in between. For most of those nasty things that are going on, we have very good models for them. But there are a few of them that are difficult, if not impossible, to try to determine. Primary of those. Uh, are the charged atmosphere, what we typically call the ionosphere, and the neutral atmosphere, of which we, uh, the most significant part is the wet, the lowest level, which we call the troposphere. So there you get the ionosphere correction and the troposphere correction. The way that Opus Rapid Static, the short period one, the short period processing engine of Opus, the way that that works is it uses the surrounding cores to where your mark is at, and it since we know where the coordinates of those are and we know where the coordinates of the satellites are, we can make, use that information to make very accurate corrections, determine very accurate corrections for the uh, neutral and charged atmosphere, for the ionosphere and the troposphere. We do that to the surrounding cores, then we extrapolate that to the position of your mark, and lo and behold, we have everything we need. We know all the little bits and pieces except where your coordinates are. So then we can fix integers and tell you where your coordinates are. Works very well. Works extremely well. Uh, except when there are not cores surrounding your mark. Then we have a little bit of trouble. Opus Static works on an, uh, the alternate strategy. If you have a long time, if you can afford to spend time on your mark, then the satellites themselves travel over your head. They change position for you. What that does is that allows you to separate all the possible po combinations of what could be right answers. It allows you to separate all those out, and only one works for all those positions of the satellites. So your effect, uh, the, having more data effectively allows you to eliminate all these erroneous possibilities, leaving only the correct possibility. So by doing that, the data itself from your mark tells you what the uh, neutral and charged atmospheric corrections are. That's the best of all possible worlds. Then you can get the integers fixed, and you can do your coordinates at your, at your site. We can do this everywhere in the world, and we do do this everywhere in the world. So each one has advantages and disadvantages. If we're willing to take a shorter span of if you want to take a shorter span of time and can position yourself inside the cores, then you're good to go. If you want to take a longer span of time, that's in the long run probably better, but you can do it anywhere in the world. How good can you do with Opus? This is the real question. What can I do with Opus? We claim that you can do about one to two centimeters horizontally and two to four centimeters vertically. This is the first time I'll say this. It probably won't be the last time I say this. We do that work for you. You put your data in, Opus processes it, but to guarantee the quality of that data is your responsibility. No human looks at it. We make no judgments. We just put it into the machine and it spits an answer out and emails it to you. So it's your responsibility to determine the quality of your product. That's the price you pay for having an automatic system. 
To elaborate on, on this a little bit, uh, there have been actually a, quite a few studies about how good can you do with Opus? What kind of accuracies can I generate with Opus solutions? The one that I always harken back to is the one when, uh, from one of my coworkers, Mark Eckel, and a bunch of other people. Uh, those are the two blue lines you see on this graph. And it, what it, this is is a measure of how long do I need to sit on a mark to get a certain estimated accuracy from my results. He didn't use Opus to do this, but he used the, o the software that is used with Opus, Pages. He used the software that was used in Opus to do this, so this is applicable to Opus as well. Opus Rapid Static uses a different processing engine, and you see I've only put sort of fuzzy purple blocks there for what Opus Rapid Static does. Opus Rapid Static, to estimate an uncertainty associated with it, and these are just estimates of the uh, uncertainty associated with your coordinates, but to estimate uncertainties associated with Opus Rapid Static is a much more complex task because, again, we need those cores surrounding you. So how the cores position themselves around your mark, the amount of data, how much data overlaps with the cores, et cetera, comes out to influence uh, the kind of accuracy you can get. So you can sort of, I can sort of make a broad estimate of what you can get with Opus Rapid Static, but I can't do a precise estimate. But as Dave mentioned, we do have a web page up and running. I'm sure it wasn't user. I'm sure we just had a technical glitch for a moment or two. God forbid that that ever happens again. Uh, but there is a web page on the site. In my opinion, it's buried deep down in the bowels of NGS, NGS's web page. But it is there. I, just before I came here, I checked this link, and it's still actually really there. So if you want to see what kind of an estimate of accuracy you can get from Opus Rapid Static, Specific for your mark, specific for your position, I encourage you to go to that website and take a look. Now, you've submitted your data to Opus and you've got an answer back. I was a, uh, I'm a devious person and I, I may explain why I was devious in doing this, but I took a, a mark. It happened to be a cores. I took two, two hours of data from that cores and submitted it to Opus, not allowing the site to reference to itself but to the surrounding cores. I submitted it to Opus Static to see how, how good I could do. And because this is a known mark, I happen to know that I did about 2 centimeters vertically and about 1.6 centimeters horizontally, uh, excuse me, 2 centimeters horizontally and 1.6 centimeters vertically. So I fell within the, what I claim we can do with Opus. The real question is, if you got this solution back, how would you be comfortable with this? Would you know how well you could do with this? Well, aside from verifying that you actually told Opus the truth, that you actually gave it the right data set, that you actually told it the right antenna type and the right antenna height, because I know you would never lie to Opus. Uh, what you should do is, and we publish this, I give the uh, URL for this as well, we publish certain guidelines. These are a minimum set of quality control measures that you can use to evaluate how good you, you are doing. And you can see that we want uh, more than 90% of the observations available to be used, I use 97. You want more than 50% of the integers fixed to their ambiguity values, I did 100, yay. Uh, you want the overall RMS, that's the post-fit RMS after fitting your, uh, adjusting your data, you want that to be less than 3 centimeters, we did less than 1, yay for me again. And you want the peak-to-peak -peak uncertainties associated with each coordinate to be less than 5 centimeters, and they're all uh, less than 2 centimeters. So for this one, I give a happy face. I'm just from this one example, just from this one data point, this one uh, test, I'm, con I'm relatively content with this solution. Remember, I was one of the ways I was devious was that I took exactly two hours of data. That allows me to submit it both to Opus Static and Opus Rapid Static. So I submitted it to, to Opus Rapid Static as well. And again, we see here I did about 2.4 centimeters horizontally. Uh, almost zero centimeters vertically compared to what I know the right answer is. That's not what's always going to happen. That's random chance for this mark. I did that well on this mark on this day with this data set. But it's consistent with what I told you, I suggested to you that Opus could do. So we're still doing pretty good with this. But again, the real question is, how do, I, how do you know, how do I know that this is a good solution? Assuming that I don't know if this is the right answer or not, how do I know if this is a good answer, if this is a good solution? Again, at that same location, you can find guidelines, and it tells you ways that you can try to judge if this is a good solution or not. They're very similar but not identical because we use two slightly different processing engines. But again, you should use at least 50% of the observations. I barely squeak past that with 51% of the observations. I didn't mention it, but 
uh, Opus Rapid Static uses a two-step process in doing the adjustment, doing get the final final result for your product, for your uh, data set. So you actually see two numbers here on the quality indices. Both of those numbers should be greater than three, and you can see that both of them are much greater than three. Or maybe you can't see that the print's pretty small. The normalized RMS should be about one. This is 0.28. Should you be nervous about that? Well, this is just me talking, but. Uh, if you model things perfectly, if you do everything just right, if you have a godlike knowledge of your own data, then you should be able to, to make this number come out to be very close to one. The normalized uh, RMS is essentially the standard error of unit weight. Unit weight, you want it to be one. What's a good number? Well, my experience says that if you're within something like 0.1 to 1.1, you've probably got a good satisfactory number here. So you've got quite a range to work in there. Now, if you're at 1 100th or 10, then you should become very nervous. But if you're in sort of this range, if you're sort of close to 1, you're probably doing all right. And the uncertainty, again, should be less than 5 centimeters. And again, these are, are uh, true uncertainties, standard, uh, standard deviations from the solution, not peak-to-peak -peak errors. These should be about 5 centimeters. And again, we're very low here. In this case, I give this kind of a neutral face. And why do I say that? I say that because even though I said this is an okay number, it's a little bit on the low side, but in particular, Opus R Rapid Static in this case is sewn away half my data. I'm never happy about that, but that's just the way it worked in this kind. So those are kind of the ways with Opus Static and Opus Rapid Static. Those are the minimal criteria to kind of guess of what, how well you're doing with your, with your solutions. Beyond this, you have an option. If you're a nice person and you like to be friendly with other people, you can share your results. That's what Opus Database is for. You can share your results. Uh, you, it's voluntary. You don't have to do it. And there are some rules involved. Again, I give the URL to see what those rules are, but I also list them here if you want to read through them. I'm not going to read them to you. I will tell you that publishing through Opus is not the same as, as blue booking. It's not the same as going to the integrated database, just as Jerry said. It's a, it's a streamlined process. We're trying to make it easy for you, trying to make it easier than it has been in the past without losing any of the significance, uh, most significant information that, that would be provided. How do you publish? Well, initially, actually, you have to register your address, and that'll come up when you try to do this. But when you submit to Opus, uh, if you look down the page, I skipped past it the first time, but there's a neat little button there that says option. And this is the top of the Opus page. I've kind of scrolled down a little bit. There's a neat little button that says op options. You click on that, and a new part of the window appears. We, technically, it's called accordion. accordion uh, we accordion that part of the, the form out and gives you some more stuff to fill in or look at. And down here towards the bottom of this is, a, is an option that says publish my solution. Normally it says no, you just pull the little menu and say yes. You click the upload button and away you go and you're happy. No matter what happens, you're always going to get your Opus solution. That goes off on its own path. So you're going to get your Opus solution no matter what. But if you said you will publish, then a new window appears. And that gives you an opportunity to provide a brief description of the mark that you're sitting on, upload some quality photos, give a nice description of what the... Uh, how to find your mark, and I'll take another minute on an aside here. Uh, we live in a, a technological society. Everybody knows how to use Google Maps or MapQuest or something like that. In the good old days, you used to have to say, well, I went to this town, and then I went five steps out of this town and ten marks north, and it was like, kind of like a pirate map or something like that. If you can get us close, we can use your data to get us close. What we need to do for you to do is to tell us, now that we're close, how do we get there from there? So from the nearest road or from the nearest corner or something like that. You don't have to track the whole way because we only give you 500 letters, 500 characters to make this description. So we, you are required to be terse and uh, specify the last few steps rather than the first few steps. You can still abort at any time if you decide you don't want to play nice with the other kids. You can still abort. You'll still get your Opus solution. Everything will be fine. But if you do go through and complete this, then what will happen is that you'll receive an additional email. You'll get your Opus solution, and you'll get a second email. And that email will contain a link. That link will be essentially back to that web page again with a mock-up of the data sheet. 
that uh, Jerry showed, and I'll show again uh, just a minute, the Opus database data sheet. And you'll have a chance to do any last minute corrections, uh, fill in any missing information, or any op missing optional information, things like that. If you fill that out, again, you can still abort at this point, but if, again, if you're playing nice with the other kids, you can click uh, accept, you've quality controlled your Opus solution, you click upset, uh, accept, and away it goes. There's some automatic quality control that is done, and a person, at this point in time, a person actually still looks at your mark description at this time to make sure that everything's copacetic, everything's as it should be. But generally, assuming that person is awake and not on vacation, et cetera, et cetera, uh, generally, within a few hours, no more than a day or two, you will kick, hit that publish button and your, your, your result will be published into the Opus database. So you'll get that kind of turnaround, a, a few hours to a day or so turnaround to see your marks published. This is, as, data, as Jerry showed, this is what a data sheet looks like. I'm not gonna describe it here, but I will tell you that if you go to the Opus page, there's a link that says published solutions. That allows you to search by latitude and longitude, by zip code, et cetera, et cetera. Many different options. That allows you to look at what other people have submitted. So if you're interested in publishing through Opus, and I encourage you to be interested in publishing through Opus, you can look at what some of the other folks have done, what some of the folks have done in your area, and uh, look at the guidelines to see if, if you would like to try to contribute to the Opus database as well. All right, I'm done with Opus. I'm gonna to try to leave time at the ends for questions, so I'm gonna rush ahead here. What's going on in the future? The first thing that's going on is CORE's coordinates. Uh, as we've been saying all day today, everything changes, really and truly, everything changes. Nothing stays the same. Every place is in motion. Where I live in Kansas, the motion is fairly benign and predictable. In some places, it's chaotic. If you look at California, they have little things called earthquakes. Interesting things happen. Places move in unexpected ways during earthquakes. In this area, your, your marks respond to the local dynamic environment. People draw down water, and your mark moves someplace. So there's a range of environments that are causing these things to move, but everything moves. Technologically, our knowledge of these phenomena, how the satellites work, how the signals trans, uh, are, are propagate through the atmosphere, all this is improving as well. So we have a change in the, in the quality of technology we have to do this work. And logistically, everything's changing again. Satellites grow old, hardware grows old, sites get knocked over, sites come and go, satellites come and go. So there's a lot of stuff going on. For cores, what does this mean? Well, the last comprehensive, truly comprehensive cores uh, adjustment that was done was actually done about a decade ago. Old technology. Nobody has their same computer they had 10 years ago, or at least I hope you don't have your same computer you had 10 years ago, because it's old technology. This is all old technology. However, what was done in that adjustment was actually pretty good. Those coordinates were actually very good. What suffered a little bit were the velocities associated with that, those coordinates. In many cases, not in all, but in many cases those velocities were poor. Since that time, hundreds of new cores have come online. They were not part of that adjustment. So their velocities were generated with a model. And it was actually, it's actually a very simple model to boot. So we have a, a growing number of cores that have relatively poor velocities associated with it. This creates an untenable situation for cores and for opus. But thank goodness, uh, there's a global community that's worried about this just as much as we are. So again, the International GNSS Service, along with the, uh, I can't remember the whole name, the IERS, the International Earth Rotation and Reference Frame Service, I think is what they call themselves now. Periodically, they get together with the uh, academic and, and industrial groups throughout the world, and they all get together and say, give us all your data. Give, your, give us your, uh, your radio beacon, your, your DORIS data, your GPS data, your GLONASS data. Give us everything you've got and we'll do a comprehensive adjustment of all this stuff. We'll bring everything together into the same reference frame. For the IGS itself, their contribution, and I, I won't, I'll warn you about this, but I won't try to bore you with this, but the IGS calls its contribution to this, uh, it has a standalone contribution to this, and it calls its contribution to this, its solution to its data sets, the, the 
the, G, the GLONASS and GPS global data set, it calls the, that reference frame the IGS-08. And that's what we're going to live with for the time being. Uh, they made that available. It became operational in April uh, 2011, very recently. It was vetted extensively before that time. There's information on the web. If you're interested about that, I can steer you onto that. I encourage you to send me a, give me an email and I can pass it on. I do provide a link here to, that talks about it a little bit, but there's much more written about it. NGS was part of that group. So in addition to its contribution to the IGS-08, the We've had this reference several times today. The multi-year multi cores uh, project began. So in addition to the sites that were agreeable to the IGS, NGS processed all the available cores data for uh, more than a decade, uh, more than a decade's worth of data. This is where people get a little uh, sticky about things. Uh, what we have done is not really the IGS-08, but it is consistent with the IGS-08. So to try to relieve confusion about that, and I know I just put confusion in your head, but to try to relieve confusion about that, we're going to call this the IGS-08 as well. It, the reference frame is as consistent with the IGS-08 as we can make it. So that multi-year uh, core solution will be created and will be labeled the IGS-08. Once that is done, and it essentially is done, those coordinates will be rotated from the International Terrestrial Reference Frame from the IGS-08 into the NAD-83, into that frame. And that's what will become the NAD-83-2011. That's what cores will start to tell you uh, are the coordinates of the, the sites in the future. That product will be available, uh, we hope, the plan is still to have that product available roughly in July of this year, so just a few weeks away. Now, I'll tell you, and I'm, I'm actually very pleased about this for what that's worth, but the intent here is to do it right, not fast, or not on a schedule. For right now, the release of the CORS information, as of the last meeting I sat in a couple weeks ago, the release of the CORS information is still on schedule to go on 2011, that, uh, July 2011. That may slip a little bit, but we're, we, they are still on schedule to release that. Opus probably won't come online, almost certainly won't come online with the, the uh, NAD 2011 coordinates at that time. That's going to slip back a little bit to give people more chance to adjust to the idea that Opus is going to give them different numbers. But it is coming. It will come before the end of the year. So it is coming. So be ready for that. If you want more information about the, the multi-year core solution, this was listed before, but I also give the uh, uh, URL to, that gives some... Uh, Basically, it's a, a fact sheet, a cheat sheet from the, the uh, webinars that were done and gives you the information that was, was presented in the webinars. All right, why do we do this? Why do we go to this trouble? Well, as I said, beyond the fact that everything is changing, this, these solutions, this, uh, I, this IERS solution, this IGS solution, this NGS solution, the core solution that's coming out, is the most consistent solution that has ever been generated in geodesy, in surveying for that matter, in all these kinds of earth sciences, we have to bootstrap ourselves. And hopefully every time we bootstrap ourselves up one level, we do better. This is actually true in this case. We've been doing better each time uh, for the last decade or so. That wasn't always the case, but it, the last decade or so, we're actually doing better. So it's the most consistent uh, that's ever been done to date. And it's consistent not, in, not just within GPS, but it's consistent within all the other space geodesy technologies as well. They've all have come together very tightly and very nicely. Very good thing. Everybody's happy. Data from 1997 to 2010, the middle of 2010 were, was used. As a matter of fact, there are some cases of people uh, bringing up data all the way back to 1994. But everybody con con uh, contributed data from 1997 to 2010. The absolute antenna models were used. What does that mean? We used to use relative models. Uh, you're probably aware of this. I apologize for going over this again. But we used to actually take an antenna and say, this is the standard. It's going to be zeros. We decree this is all zeros. And then we'd measure all the other antennas relative to that. That works very well. It actually did. It actually works very well. Until your stations start to get further and further apart. And then measuring it like they're sitting together and me measuring it like they're around the curve of the Earth doesn't work so well. Also, one thing that the 
relative antenna measurements can't do is there's another antenna that we hardly ever talk about. There's an antenna on the satellites, the antenna that broadcasts to you. These absolute antenna calibration models have models for the antenna satellites, the, the satellite antennas as well. So we have a better model for all the satellites that are used both on the ground and in the air. State-of-the-art geophysical models were used. It's actually, I'm, I'm a little bit embarrassed for my community to say that's the first time that's ever happened. Everybody got together, everybody agreed, we're all gonna use the same models. And by gum, pretty much they all did use the same models. So again, everybody's on the same sheet. More important to you is that the epoch of these coordinates, the, the date that is tagged with these coordinates, has been moved almost 10 years into the future. So now when you go out and do a survey, we're not going to be projecting the course coordinates 15 years into the future. We're going to be projecting these course coordinates only a few years into the future. That means the, any errors associated with velocities will be much smaller. You'll have better coordinates because we have better velocities and uh, projecting them a small, smaller distance in the future. This may be a little scary, but the plan is to have this frame, this process, evolve into the future. These reference frames used to be done at discrete intervals, depending on when people thought it was necessary. Sometimes it was a year or two, sometimes it was many years. But the idea now is, gee, everybody's singing on the same sheet, everybody's doing the same thing. We can just sort of do a mini solution and add that into the end, do another adjustment and do this and give a new updated uh, value. So the idea is that now that everybody's working together well, we can start doing this at a more rapid pace and be more consistent from adjustment to adjustment. You put this all together, what does this mean for you? You put this all together, we got better coordinates, much better velocities, and much better uncertainties associated with all the the GPS sites in the world, but in particular, all the cores in uh, the, the North American network. That's good for you and that's good for Opus. Now, that's the technical, sort of the technical part of it. What's the practical part of it? What does this mean for me? Well, if I haven't made you so, I have failed my job. You should be a little bit nervous about this, but your anxiety is groundless. Don't be nervous about this. This is actually a step in the right direction. It doesn't mean that there, uh, I'm not trying to say that you shouldn't have, you should have no anxiety about this because you should, things are gonna change. You'll have to adjust to that. But don't have unnecessary anxiety about this. We are moving in the right direction. Please believe me, I want people to believe me. Uh, you're gonna have better coordinates, more consistent coordinates across the entire cores network. As I said, you're gonna have much better velocities on all the sites and you're gonna have much better uncertainties on all the sites, both on the coordinates and the velocities. That means that as we go into the future, we're going to be able to give you better and better core, uh, we're going to be able to give you better cores coordinates going into the future. If we can give you better cores coordinates going into the future and into the past, that means we can give you better Opus results. So doing this makes Opus better. And in particular, because this uh, recent solution spans so much data, everything that's knowable about that data set, uh, the global communities tried to know, uh, and we've taken into account discontinuities, earthquakes, all people bump, you know, back in their car into marks and things like that. We've tried to take all those things into account. There'll be less concern when combining old and new data sets. So you'll be, eventually you'll be happier as you add more and more data, you use Opus more and more often going into the future. All right, those are the coordinates. The next big thing coming down the pike is a thing called OpusNet. OpusNet, when it's publicly available, it's not publicly available yet, but when OpusNet is publicly available, it'll look just like the other processing engines. The four beautiful, beautifully simple questions will still be there, the options will still be there. It'll look just like the other processing engines, but there will be some differences. There'll be a different strategy in how the data are pro your data are processed. OpusNet will include an ocean tide loading model for your mark. All the cores already have uh, open ocean tide loading values associated with them, so we're gonna use a model to estimate an ocean tide loading correction for your mark. We're gonna use a combination of distant and nearby cores, and we're going to perform a network solution on your data. And after I complete this slide, I'm gonna talk about each of these individually. OpusNet is being tested now, quite a bit tested now. They're using the same computer I am, so they annoy me sometimes. It should be in beta version by the end of this year, so you can start to look on the beta, NGS beta page to see if OpusNet shows up and start to use it in the not too distant future. All right, the three things, ocean tide loading, near and far cores, uh, network solution. 
ocean tide loading. What is ocean tide loading? I'm uh, always hesitant to talk about ocean tide loading in an ocean tide er uh, in an ocean, uh, ocean side area, but I will anyway. The sun and the moon go overhead. Every day the tide comes in, the tide comes out. The tide comes in, the tide goes out. Think about what that means. Every time the tide comes in, you have millions of tons of water resting upon the surface of the earth for an hour or two. And then it falls back out and the tide goes away and now you have millions of tons less water sitting on the surface of the earth. What happens? That weight comes in, it presses the earth down, the weight goes out, the earth rebounds back up. So twice a day with the tides, the earth's surface rebounds up and down. This shameless self-promotion, this is from an earlier work that I did. I won't try to explain everything, but look, try to look at the lengths of these lines. That's an indication of what the, the magnitude of the ocean tide loading signal is. This is five centimeters down here. So along the east coast, twice a day, they go up and down by three or four centimeters every day. Along the west coast, it's about a centimeter. It goes up to three or four centimeters here. Up in the Gulf of Alaska, which is kind of a big basin that catches the water, they go up or down by five or six centimeters a day. On the Gulf Coast, ooh, you're pretty safe. Not too bad. The Gulf is shallow. So you have tides, but they're not too bad. But one thing that I like to point out to folks is, look at this. There's about a centimeter signal all the way to the Mississippi River. Why is that? Well, it turns out that the Atlantic Shelf the, crustal sh the co uh, continental shelf out here is actually a pretty big thing, and a lot of water rests on it. So the deformation that occurs actually d displays itself all the way into almost the, the Mississippi River. So yes, in Columbus, Ohio, they're going up and down a, c a centimeter a day because the water is coming in and the tide's going out. We, have mo we do have a model that's capable of, of uh, generating estimated values for this correction. It's not perfect, but it's actually very good based upon satellite altimetry data, just like the course coordinates uh, corrections are done with. So the model works very well. That will be included in OpusNet. Why use distant and nearby cores? Well, it may seem counterintuitive, but if you use cores that are a long way away, you can actually do some, th some things better than if you just use cores that are nearby. In particular, the neutral atmosphere the tropospheric correction can be done if you have sites, a few sites that are far away. So by using distance cores, we can do one of the corrections that we need to do. We can do the neutral atmosphere correction better than we could do if we just use nearby. Using more cores allows us to minimize the effect of if a core, if a cores is missing for, on a given day for a given data set. So if you go out and occupy and reoccupy a mark, no, no site is perfect, the cores may be down, it may be undergoing maintenance, may just be missing data. By having, these more core, by having more cores in the solution, a missing site is less significant to your results, so you'll get more consistent results over time. And last and certainly not least, by, allow, by including distant cores in the solution, that allows us to emphasize quality as well as quantity. There are about 15, 18 sites in North America that are known as well as as any GPS site in the world. They've been operating continuously for 20 or more years. They've been monitored daily for 20 or more years. We know their positions. We know their velocities. We know their histories. That way we can include sites that we essentially can guarantee that we know everything possible about, possible about them. And that allows us to take advantage of the strength of that data set. And that comes into this, a network solution. Why do we do a network solution? Opus static, historically, up to this point in time and for the foreseeable future, for the rest of its life, does uh, you give it your data and it selects three nearby cores and gives you a solution. Well, what it actually does is it does each of those baselines. It processes each of those baselines completely independently of the other. Then it does what I will call a crude average and looks at the peak-to-peak -peak scatter, and those are the statistics you get. Each baseline is separate from the other. That's not really the way we want to do things. And OpusNet will correct this failing if it is a failing. Again, Opus does extremely well now, but this will make it do a little bit better. OpusNet allows us to combine all data, and this is where the idea of having these quality cores out at a distance come, really comes into play. As my boss likes to say, and I like this phrase, doing a network solution allows the data to speak. Good data is... Good data ends up, as you do the matrix manipulation, as you process the data, good data is stronger than weak data, and that can reflect itself in these solutions. 
So by using more cores and using a network solution and using a better set of models to do this processing, what you end up doing is getting more robust coordinates and more realistic uncertainties associated with your data. It looks like a win all around. Is it really a win all around? Do we really need another flavor of Opus? The answer is probably yes. Uh, two of my coworkers, uh, Neil Weston and Jim Ray, have done an extensive study. They continue to do this study of, of OpusNet. And what they found is that using OpusNet, the east and west components compared to Opus uh, are significantly better, significantly better in that the scatter is smaller and that they agree better with other sources. They're significantly better than Opus static. For the height component, there's no degradation. It doesn't get any worse. So at worst, at, at worst you're doing better in the horizontal and you're doing no worse in the vertical. Probably, in, when all shakes out in the end, you'll be doing better in all three coordinates. They're already getting uh, results that indicate that, but they're doing a lot of testing it. So you're going to do no worse in the horizontal. You'll do better in the horizontal. You'll do no worse in the vertical. And the resulting coordinates will agree better with other sources, and it's just the way we want to do things. We want to do a network solution so that you can get more robust coordinates, as I said, and better uncertainties associated with them. There have been some talks about this. Uh, I'll list, I listed only one here in case you want to go track down more than I can say here about what OpusNet does and what's coming up with it. Opus projects. Shifting gears again, Opus projects. This is what I work on. You can, you can see the love in my eyes. Opus projects. What Opus projects does is it gives you, uh, it extends Opus. Opus is one data set in, one solution out. Opus projects allows you to take many data sets in, more than one data set in, more than one occupation of a mark in, and do it as a project, do it as a single coherent solution. What is it, beyond that, what does it offer you? Well, you still get to use Opus to upload, so you'll get that immediate feedback on your solutions through Opus, but you'll have some data visualization and management tools to see how your project, how your data as it comes in, to see how your project is progressing. You'll have more controls on how the processing occurs. Opus essentially gives you no controls. Opus Projects gives you some controls. And this is where I get to point out Pages, my other child. Uh, you'll get more controls over how to operate Pages, and you'll get solution, solution visualizations aids to see how your processing is proceeding as you go forward. Opus Projects is in beta development right now. The web page is up and operating. Because Opus Projects is more complex than Opus is, at, the, at this time and for the foreseeable future, we're requiring training before we let you go willy-nilly uh, active with Opus Project. But there are training workshops going. The next one is in San Diego in July, and there's more workshops to come. So if you're interested in it, go to the training page at NGS or contact me, and we'll let you know where the workshops are occurring. This is an Opus Project page. This is where I try to describe in a few slides uh, a very complex process, but what's going to happen is uh, after you complete a project, you'll uh, tell your field crews or you'll tell yourself that there's a project in existence, so when you upload, tell Opus that you want to upload to my project. If you have a larger project, so you have field crews out in the field, uh, while you're at home uh, sweating, your, sweating away at your computer, you'll actually be able to see the data comes, come in as they upload it. So while your crews are still in the field, while your crews are still near their mark, you'll start to get information about the data they've collected, how it comes in, you'll be able to see reports about that data and see how it's progressing as it goes along. The idea being that the old way, the bad way to do it is that crews would go around, they'd uh, send in, they'd mail in their data or they'd upload their data, they'd move on. Something would happen, they'd find out it was bad, and they'd have to go back to the mark. We're trying to shorten that time down so that we can get you to talk to your crews and get them making corrective, taking corrective actions while they're still near the mark. That hopefully will save you money and time. Uh, in this particular case, you can see that uh, some marks have already been loaded. You can see the cores that came up with those marks, and you can see a tabular format. Here are the sessions. Sessions are uh, data sets that overlap in time, significantly in time. So you can see the sessions that have occurred and the sites that, the marks that are in each of those sessions. 
Beyond that, as you as a project manager, as the data starts to come in, there's no reason why you can't start processing it. It's there. It's already at your fingertips. So even, again, even while your crews are out in the field, you can start processing the data beyond what Opus has done. So if, you're, if you have a session that is complete, you can go ahead and uh, begin working with the data, review reports, edit mark descriptions. Uh, you can add core data if uh, you want additional cores into your session, into your data set, into your project. You can process sessions, and you can start to look at the results. Again, all the while the crews may yet be near the marks in the field. So that, uh, try to streamline the entire process. Try to shorten the time interval between taking data and processing data. Hopefully that will save everybody time and effort in the end. Again, here you can see the baselines that were generated. You have some control in this processing. You see the baselines that were generated. You have some control over the, how those baselines were created. Uh, we don't require that the cores be held fixed. If you want to hold, hold your own passive mark fixed, that's perfectly fine. As I say in my internal reports to my group, my job is to give you rope. If you want to hang yourself, I'm going to help you do it. So if you want to hold your own marks, if you want to hold your cores fixed, all that stuff is available to you. You have the flexibility to do that. If you have coordinates that you like better than uh, the formal coordinates, go ahead and stick them in and do it. Uh, you have that kind of flexibility with it. I wouldn't necessarily advise that, but you have the flexibility to do it. Once all the individual sessions are processed, once you've got all the bits and pieces put together and all put together, then you can perform your own network adjustment, an adjustment on your project. And that will give you a single self-consistent set of, of, of coordinates for all the marks in your project. These can in turn be published to Opus. Uh, it, it's not quite, but it's pretty darn close to a one-click one publishing, uh, publishing task. So the idea, again, I, I don't mean to disparage blue booking, but the idea that you had to suffer through blue booking, we're, taking, we're trying to take all that away from you. We're trying to make it simple and easy for you to do. That helps you save money, that helps you save time, and that helps us get the data in where everybody can use it faster and faster. And again, a little blatant self-promotion. Uh, these gray marks are the Opus solutions, the purple marks are the session solution, and the green square there is the network solution. And indeed, by sacrificing a, the a little bit of the simplicity of Opus for the little bit of the complexity of Opus projects, I am indeed reducing the scatter of the Opus results. You can do better by using Opus projects. I can't guarantee you you'll do better by using Opus projects, but you can do better by using Opus projects. So now the real question, do we need yet another flavor of Opus? The practical answer is probably yes. NGS and probably you as well have a history of projects that just can't be completely supported or well supported by Opus. Opus projects is an attempt by us to address that problem with an Opus-like tool. The academic answer is probably yes. As I said, as good as Opus does, and believe me, that is very good, as good as Opus does, by sacrificing a little simplicity for a little flexibility, you can do better still. And I'm done. Hopefully I finished in, within my allotted time because I wanted to allow time for questions. So if anybody has any questions, I'll try to field them now. Thank you very much. Yeah, Bill. Mark, if, if uh, Roy Daka and Randy Osborne would send you 10 days of data from 65 stations, would Opus Projects handle them again? Yes. Okay. Uh, I don't want to encourage this because Opus Projects is a beta product, product right now. It has limited resources. But we've already had product, projects come through that don't have 65 but have two or 300 marks in them. And blatant self-promotion. I will tell you that one of my best buddies, Dave Zink, the State uh, Geodetic Advisor for Minnesota, uh, lo loves to call me up and stroke me. Uh, he says... Uh, he is forced to do blue booking, but he loves to do Opus projects. And the first time he did an Opus project, he saved about 50% of the time. The second Opus projects he did, he saved about 90% of the time. And the third Opus projects he did, he saved 97% of the time compared to blue booking. So again, you may not do better, but you're going to do it faster. And I saw a hand back there towards the back. Yeah. What's the status of the L1 only version of Opus? Did that just kind of die? Uh, the L1 version, consider it dead. 
And why do I say that? We have, Pages is my other child, as I mentioned. We have an option inside Pages now that will, it's kind of hard to explain, but it transitions from L1 only for very short lines to an ionosphere-free combination gracefully. So there's not a distinct cutoff where I'm going to do L1 here and I'm going to do an L1-L2 combination here. It does it gracefully going through there. That should satisfy your need for an L1 product and still give you consistency across a, a small project to a bigger project. Yeah. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, will, when the uh, new horizontal datum comes out uh, for cores, when they're, you know, updated, will you have the option to select in, in Opus like you do with Geoid 03 and Geoid 09, older epochs or datums? All right, I'm, I'm going to go out, so I'm going to go out something on a limb here, and I'm going to tell you yes. But anybody who knows me, oops, my, my real boss is about to say something. Uh, yeah, uh, what we're planning on is having a three-month overlap on that so people can transition to it. Yeah, well, well and the reason why I ask, sometimes we go back and try yeah. to compare historic data and uh, where you have the option to select uh, a datum you previously adjusted in, it, 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 it helps to compare apples and apples, you know. Well, our initial thing is to have it active for three months overlap between the last, uh, the new epic and the last epic. Uh, and then probably, as Mark was indicated, we'll, we never throw anything away or do away with anything, so I'll check to see what that is. Okay. Uh, the uh, Opus DB, uh, if your data does not meet the quality indicators, and when you submit it, it will not publish, correct? That's correct. If, uh, and you saw the rules there, uh, there's an automatic screening and a man, as I mentioned, there's an automatic screening and a manual screening. If it doesn't make that, uh, you'll get booted. The fortunate thing with Opus DB is the, the, the folks who are responsible for doing that screening are actually nice guys, nice gal, guys and gals, nice people. So they'll often send you an email to say, hey, did you, you, got, you got bumped and this is the reason why you did. So you actually have a, a little better, you actually have a reasonable chance of trying to, I can't say correct, but to address those issues. And if you're submitting multiple observations <coughs> on the same point, let's say over a three day period, how does it handle the solutions? Or right, oh, my, bo my, my nearer boss, my shorter, my nearer to me boss just rocked in his chair uh, right now, what you'll see is uh, you'll be able to see the, the uh, data sheets for each of those marks, and there's, there are links to say, hey, did you know there's other points associated with this mark? Okay. Now, I, again, I'm going to go off, off, uh, off this piece of paper, which has nothing to do with my presentation. I'm going to go off this paper to say we're actually working on tools right now. Some of those things, like you saw with Opus Projects, Opus database is a true logical relationship database. And there's no reason why what goes on in Opus database can't be similar to what goes on in Opus projects. So there are actually people right now working on those similar sort of Opus projects tools for Opus database. They're not coming in the short future, but they are coming down the pike. So you're going to have more tools with Opus database than you ever would have thought possible. One in more a few years. years. Yeah. There's some confusion about uh, antenna types in Opus, uh, particularly the R8 GNSS. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Which one do we select? Uh, I'll hand that off to my boss. <laughs> He's at the center of this contribu controversy. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to be able to give you a final answer, but I, uh, the question was brought for me, and I, I have to tell you that there's a, I can't remember the names exactly, but there was a Geo++ uh, absolute calibration in the IGS file. Yeah. And that disagreed with the IGS, uh, or the NGS relative calibration converted to absolute. And uh, we have, uh, we have not resolved what, why that difference uh, exists. So my, I don't know what to tell you at, at the moment. We're, we're 
looking at it periodically, it, it, it comes back. Somebody who's an RA antenna user asks us this question. It's getting annoying, and I'd like to settle it, uh, but I don't know what the answer uh, yeah, is. Yeah, because we're seeing like a two centimeter yeah. difference between three, two and a half in some cases with the same data set, you know. So that sounds about right. And, uh, you know, this is too much inside baseball and what goes on behind the curtain, but there's another antenna that uh, we we did our calibrations. We have a serious disagreement with the uh, Geo Plus Plus results as well. It's one of the top con antennas. Uh, I don't understand that as what, why that is. We've been in touch with Geo Plus Plus. We looked at our stuff. I, I would swear that it's right. The residuals look good, but we uh, we just can't match their results. Which is not to say that we must in every case. I mean, uh, but we'd like to understand that. And most other antennas, we have a millimeter, sub-millimeter agreement. Uh, but you're right, there's a couple of anomalies, and I don't know. When, on the day that you get at least two people measuring the same thing, you're going to fail to get differences periodically, and I don't know. We'll see. Okay. Okay. Enough from you. Anybody else? Way back in the back. Yes, sir. What is the difference between, say, a countywide or parish-wide uh, elevation benchmark system being designed and observed, like uh, Dave Zilkowski was talking about this morning, and someone taking, say, Opus DB, and uh, with that being published, considering that as a parish or countywide uh, benchmark system, one mark at a time? Could you reconcile the two different approaches? Anybody who wants to help me out here, please stand up. Uh, can you reconcile it? Uh, are they the same? At the moment, they are not. Because, as, and for the reasons you already know, as Dave described, generally those kind, the, the former kinds of surveys, the parish-wide surveys that have done, have been done to a certain sure. set of specifications. And they meet those specifications. And as you said, what goes into Opus database is a, is a point at a time. So for a, at this point in time, they're always, they may be, the, re, the results may be very similar, but they've gone to a, a different path to reach the same point. And that is, that is a non-trivial issue. But having said that, remember that I mentioned that there are new tools coming down the pike for Opus database. And I, I have great confidence that going into the future, Reconciling those, if I may use the term, those historical kinds of uh, solutions with the solutions that may be coming into the future, I think we'll be able to reconcile those and bring those into, we can't ever agree, bring them into perfect agreement because they're different data sets, but we can reconcile the differences and bring them into alignment with each other. Yes, Jerry. You should uh, mention, even briefly, the, uh, the height mod option in Opus Projects, where we try to implement Dave Z's 59. That is correct. I did not, thank you, Jerry, I did not mention this, uh, but if you were to become sanctioned uh, Opus Projects users, uh, and you created a project, what, one of the, there's a handful of little questions that we ask you, because we want to try to figure out what you're doing in case you're going to try to break our system. Uh, one of those questions is, what type of project do you have? And right now there are three options. There's a height mod option, there's an FAA option, and there's an other option. And on the height mod option, uh, we're going to try to steer you into doing a, an NGS 58 kind of adjustment. We can't necessarily make you do it, but we're going to try to steer you by making it the easiest thing to do, to steer you into doing a height mod adjustment. Whether you do it or not, what's going to happen is when you publish that result, it's going to go through a different vetting process. It's going to be examined in a different way. So if you don't meet the height mod rules then, you're going to get bumped. The same way with the FAA rules. They have a very specific set of uh, specifications for their projects. We're going to try to steer you into doing an, uh, a PAX and SACS, a, a federal, uh, what do they call it? What's the formal word? Anyway, an FAA survey. We're going to try to steer you into doing the right thing. If, and if you publish that, then that'll be vetted by the FAA side. The FAA people working with the, the our folks working with the FAA, that it'll be vetted by them. And if it doesn't meet those specs, you'll be bumped. But we're going to try to make it easier for you to do those kinds of projects through Opus projects as well. 
steer you in that direction. Mr. Daka, Dr. Daka is waiting for me to get off the stage because I'm hogging the time. Any last questions before I leave? All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Don't, oh. don't leave yet. Oh, I'm, I'm,